Welcome everyone to Color Commentary. We are your popper commentators, Michael Pechik and Adrian Guarzalez. How's it going, Adrian? Oh, you know, good. Yeah, we've we've got a guest who we're going to introduce in a second after we get get a little bit of a uh, little bit of update upkeep news out of the way. We are now content contributors to Hipsters of the Coast, so we will have our podcast up there every week. We've also swapped over our hosting to Podbean, so you're. Your episodes should be a little bit easier to access. If our website goes down, you'll still be able to get them. It just works out better for the whole. But uh, yeah, we're very thankful to be included in the ranks of some really, really great content creators. So we're hoping that 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 all works out. But yeah, we're available through Hipsters of the Coast now. But uh, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest who I'm sure from the whatever I wind up titling this, I'm sure you'll already know. Uh, this week, we have a special guest on the show. It's Gavin Verhey. He is a senior designer at R&D. He's been a pro player, and he's been instrumental in a, a wide range of supplemental products. And uh, we found out through some some sources that he's a, he's a fan of Popper. So uh, welcome to the show, Gavin. Woo! Hey, great to be here. I am also... A hipster of the coast, also a wizard of the coast, but you know, got a little. Love. I'm from Seattle, bit a bit of a hipster, yeah. And I love the I love the work hipsters of the coast do. They're such a great website. I read their stuff all the time. So lots of really good material shows up there. So yeah. so really, just shout out to a shout out. But <laughs> nice stuff. Yeah, they they they're a great great group. We've already uh, we've we've literally been there for I think a week as of date of recording, and uh, already a really great community of people working over there you're already rolling in uh, scrooge mcduck money <laughs> i could just tell yes, already yes yes just make making those huge content creator dollars so i gotta ask yeah. i gotta ask which birdie told you about uh, my love for popper was it my own tweets about loving the format or was it something else um we were we were actually uh cued in by uh alex allman who i believe is oh, a, yeah. a mutual mutual acquaintance of ours yeah, yeah, Alex is great. I mean, I've known Alex for years from the New York area, and he's wonderful. Yeah, Alex was uh, Alex was our gateway into this uh, the content creation game. I think it was like two weeks into actually having the podcast, he did like a summary of content within the format, and we got listed, and we we lost our minds because at that point we were getting like ten people listening to us. So, but yeah, he's 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 been a, a long time friend. Um, but we, we've got you on here and I guess, I guess the first thing I kind of want to get into is you do enjoy the format and I, I'm kind of looking at what drew you towards the format because over the years, the format has definitely grown in size and popularity and also public visibility as a result. But what in particular drew you to the format? Well, let's, let's set back the clocks actually a long way. Let's hop into our little DeLorean, TARDIS, H.G. Wells time machine. Of course, now I work at Wizards of the Coast, right? So I'm a senior game designer and product architect there. And so my job is to come up with new card designs. I spend a lot of time playing Magic and modifying Magic, but also working on our new product lineup. And for example, I helped uh, bring out a number of products like Battle Bond and Commander 2018 and 2017. And I also helped bring out formats like Brawl. And before I came to Wizards, I worked on uh, an early version of Modern called Overextended. And I've always kind of loved these you know, unusual niche formats. And I've made a lot of them both internally that I've tried out with here and even before I came to Wizards externally. And many, many, many years ago, before I joined Wizards, I was a pro Magic player. And I spent a very long, long time on Magic Online. And if you can believe it, I played Popper on Magic Online ages ago, long before I joined Wizards. I played like a blue-black teachings deck with Aaron Ephemerons. This was maybe like Time Spiral. Maybe Shards was out. Not even sure. But I was playing like in these little online leagues that were run. I don't even think they were official leagues necessarily. I, 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 but was, yeah. I was going to say, I think that that's pre-Mitgo filter for the format. Yeah, yeah. So, so there used to be these, commuter, these community 
uh, created events called PDCs. They were popper deck championships, or I don't even remember, something like that. But they would be these community-run tournaments on Magic Online, and someone would, like, make the pairings, and you would go to a website, and you would go, like, find your pairing, and then you would sit down and, you know, search for your opponent and play against them. And just a way to orchestrate playing against each other, basically. I actually later cribbed this entire model when I made Overextended, and then it, that turned into modern. So it turned out working out pretty well for me that I played in these popper tournaments. But anyway, um, I really enjoyed the format back then. And I played teachings, like I said, with, with like Aaron Ephemerons, Mystical Teachings, and all these great counter spells. And I would like build these Cole Stoker, Empty the Warrens decks. Because, because of course, this was long before there was a, an established ban list or a heavily established ban list. And I was just going crazy with my storm cards. Plus, at this point, I don't even think all the old cards were on Magic Online yet, so the commons that were available were pretty tame. And I don't know, every week or every other week, I would log on and play in this event, and I had a really, really good time doing it. And then as I got more and more involved in the pro scene and testing for events and so on and so forth, my popper, my, the man I was playing popper, like, slowly fell away. And I, the format always existed in the back of my head. I knew about it. We monitored a little bit internally, of course, for banned and restricted updates, but didn't really think about it that much. And then kind of around the start of this year, end of last year, really the community has started to latch on to Popper. And I don't know, I just started playing it on Magic Online some. I threw together a mono blue control deck because I thought it'd be fun. Um, you know, after reading a bunch of tweets from people like Alex and the Professor, and I just started playing it more in Magic Online, spent a bunch of time on it. And then, uh, hilariously, if you can believe it or not, maybe it's just nostalgia, but the deck I play in Popper currently and love and played in the Popper Championship at Vegas this year and all kinds of local Popper events is Blue Black Teachings. So even though it, it, it's what I played 10 years ago or whatever and the deck looks very different now, no more Aaron Ephemerons, I'm still jamming Teachings <laughs> because I just enjoy that gameplay so much. Nothing says fun like Counterspell and Mystic teachings, Mystical Teachings, let me tell you. Oh, man. That, uh, so so have, have you picked up the, the, the new secret tech of uh, Devious, oh, Devious Cover-Up? Cover up? Oh. Devious cover up. I'll admit, I've I've been extraordinarily busy both uh, professionally and personally in the past few weeks since Guilds of Ravnica released, so I haven't had time to jump in and play online. But I've had my eye on Devious cover up. <laughs> it, it looks like a lot of. I mean, you know, because as if a few like counter spells weren't enough, how about just rebuying all that and making sure you never deck out too is really nice. If you just play two, you make sure that you're not going to deck out, which is a real concern, by the way, with the teachings deck. Sometimes you just run through all your threats and all your Gurmag anglers die or whatever and. Just being able to recycle those is pretty relevant too. Yeah, it's uh, it, that that was one of the the shocking ones when we did our set review. It, was, it definitely my eyes kind of glazed over with it because I was like, eh, this, this this doesn't strike me as anything great. And then immediately, right out of the gate, I think I think it was maybe a day after the episode went up, and there were already results pouring in with it. And I'm like, oh no, missed this one. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, guilt of Ravnica. Is Super awesome set for Popper, by the way. Like, some cool stuff in there. I, I think even later in this block, there'll be some fun stuff, too. A great thing about gold sets and multicolored sets for, for formats like Popper, which focus on commons, is that we can just make gold commons stronger than normal commons because they have the cost of two colors. You have to pay for them. So you always tend to see a lot of Ravnica or multicolor set cards, like cons block cards and so on, show up in, um, in this format. So I like that a lot. Would you go so far to say that you uh, consider Popper when you're designing those cards? So, you know, I, pardon me to anyone who's... It, although I don't know, know if this person exists, by the way. There's, I, I was about to say pardon to anyone who, like, goes around listening to all the interviews that I do on podcasts. I don't know there's someone just, like, walking around <laughs> stalking me on podcasts. If you are, tell me or don't. Maybe that's your motive. Who knows? But the, the metaphor I really like to use is, do you guys watch a lot of TV? A reasonable yes. amount. Reasonable amount. Okay. So you know how you'll have a show, and the show will have, like, a showrunner who, like, makes the arc of how the show is going to work and figures all this stuff out. But then individual episodes will have different writers, right? Right. Right. So if you look at a show, you know, like any kind of episodic show, you'll have one person man manning the whole show. But then, of course, they can't write every episode, so they'll have different people writing different episodes. And I kind of view magic as, like, okay, we've got – a show and a showrunner like we have you know the boss or whatever telling us Aaron Forsyth Mark Rosewater like kind of like okay pointing in the direction we should be should be making sets and so on and all these principles but then within that the individual lead designers of sets have things they care about and wiggle room that they put in to focus on 
things a little bit that they care about. Like, yeah, every set has to be balanced for limited. It needs common flyers, has to have splashy new mechanics, has to have stuff for constructed and so on. But there's tiny things that every lead designer brings into their sets. For example, Dave Humphreys, great, an excellent designer. He um, was the lead designer for Dominaria, which is probably one of the best sets we've ever made. Ooh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's designed, he's been here for years, designed many, many magic sets. I've got the pleasure of working with him on plenty of them. Uh, his big thing, or one of his big things, is he really dislikes shuffling. It just adds time into games. It is actually, if you're new and coming into the game, shuffling is something we found in our data that is very scary for a lot of new players. Like, they'll sign up for shuffling at the at the beginning of the game, but then, like, in the middle of a game, just shuffling kind of sucks. Um, we, you know, we think of it as, like, loading screens almost, where, like, okay, play this shuffling card. I'm going to go do, get my thing, but I, you can't take your turn yet. Loading screen, right? So he really dislikes shuffling even more than most people in R&D, and so he always tries to reduce the number of cards in his sets that shuffle to a very low amount. And, in fact, if you look at sets he's led, like Dominaria or, like, Amonkhet, they have a very low amount of shuffling in them. Um, so uh, when Ethan Fleischer... But it can get very, very minute. Like when Ethan Fleischer was lead designing Commander 2015, 2016, I can't remember which. But anyway, um, he pays attention to a format called um, Artist Constructed. I don't know if you're familiar with this format oh, or yep. not. Yeah, but we've right, heard the, of it. Right, the deal with Artist Constructed is all the cards in your deck have to be done by an artist, including basic lands. And the Kev Walker deck was awesome. It was almost there, except he had never done a cycle of basic lands. So he, he needed an artist to illustrate a bunch of basic lands for this set, and the art director went to Ethan to ask if he needed any recommendations, and he said, how about Kev Walker? So those artist constructed people can have now their Kev Walker decks, right? Um, so everyone cares about different things a little bit and gets to put a little bit of that into their sets. Popper is something I pay attention to personally. So when I'm designing a set, I think about Popper. When I'm going through our files and leaving comments on a set, and I see something in, 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 um, in common, that will make an impact in Popper, especially in, say, like a Master set or even in Guilds of Ravnica, I'll definitely leave a, a comment on it. Um, and then when I was lead designing, uh, when I lead design sets, I think about Popper as well, certainly. Now, uh, with that said, there's a lot of things to balance, and I'll freely admit that on the scale of things that I'm balancing for, Popper is toward the low end of that scale, right? If you're working on a standard set, you have to make sure that that your standard format is going to look good. You have to monitor like reprints and things like that. Of what cards are you putting back in the set? Is the limited format good and so on? But trying to find like, okay, here's a cool common we can slide in. I think is something that, that we should, we would go for. If I could, you know, unfortunately because we work so far in advance, I finished Battle Bond before like the current popper boom really hit at the end of last year. But if I could do it over again, I would have probably found room for a common that I thought would, would be popper relevant in there somewhere. As it stands, uh, I don't really think we got there. Like, there's a few commons I've seen bandied around as maybes, but nothing really showed up in Popper that came out of Battle Bond. But you know, I mean, there's room for sets going forward that I lead absolutely. Yeah, and that was a really, really eloquent way of, of putting that. So thank you for that explanation. Well, I, I appreciate that you calling something that took me like four minutes to explain <laughs> eloquent, but thank you. It made a lot of sense to me. Um, something we've talked about a lot on the show, and you sort of touched on it there, is um, we've sort of thought of the future of the format as really being defined by, you know, master sets, sets like Battle Bond, where we get a really powerful card that's been downshifted uh, to a, a common. Um, can you talk a little bit more about maybe the decision process that goes in a downshift of, say, like Elvish Vanguard from a rare to a common? Well, first of all, I'm curious, do you enjoy that? Because I've definitely heard both camps, right? Some people really enjoy the Masters Infusions because it's like, oh, man, you're powering up our format. You're giving us cool common things, etc. But then on the other hand, it almost feels disingenuous in a way to another crowd of, man, I was enjoying this format because it was all these normal set commons. And now you're just super powering it up by putting, I don't know, Din Rova Horror or whatever at common. Where I, do you I, all stand I, on that? I was about to say, you you, you let me play Din Rova Horror and Popper. I can't say a bad word against the Master sets. <laughs> I, I I personally like it as well because um, I, I do understand their limitations to the format. For example, uh, Common Planeswalker probably never happening. Um, but that being said, I, I do like to play powerful cards, uh, especially when they are not blue. Um, so I, I enjoy them. And I, th I think part of the like pushback on that on the part of some people I think is definitely tied to remembering back to when Peregrine Drake happened. And I think that's like still a very big aversion from players who were active at that time. But I think, I think people are coming around on it because 
we've gone through what at this point three different master sets since Eternal Masters. Uh, third, third Modern Masters, Iconic, and Twenty Fifth, and all of those were just boons to the format as a whole. So I think I think I think that public opinion is reversing a little on that. Yeah, uh, I just I was just honestly curious because I've heard it both ways. Personally, I mean, this is gonna sound super lame, but I'm like, yeah, I enjoy it when it adds the cards I like, and I dislike it when it adds the cards <laughs> I don't like. You know, which is, yeah. uh, I guess it's on me to make sure that doesn't happen, right? But, I mean, I think that I I think that that's a very magic player thing to say, but I, I totally understand where you're coming from. <laughs> Right. It's like, I love this card when Miracles are awesome when they're in my deck and I top deck them. <laughs> but man, it's frustrating when they're in my opponent's deck and they top deck them. Funny how and, that works, isn't it? And I, I think another reason that um, perhaps Mike and I enjoy it, and Mike, uh, you can stop me if I'm uh, not <laughs> voicing your opinion here too. Uh, we like it when they're a little more complex. And I think that we've seen uh, in some of the more standard sets re uh, recently, and certainly the gold the gold sets are a little bit uh, different because you can play with the power level a little um, with, but with New World Order, a lot of the cards just don't feel as strong overall as they maybe did, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Um, so that's part of what I like about it. Is that the cards, if the cards are powerful, I like that they're they're in the format. And I, I, I guess with the the New World Order thing, we did also like we we've talked about this literally ad nauseum for I think the past month. Um, we keep bringing up the example of Hypothesis, which it hasn't made the biggest splash in the format, but. It's a card that represents a level of complexity high enough that I was really shocked to find out that it was being printed at common. And I guess, obviously, from set to set, things are going to vary. But has has the New World Order concept behind complexity of commons perhaps tweaked over the years? And we're starting to kind of see the first examples that really stick out of that? Or is Hypothesis kind of a, a one-and-done, like... This is a weird thing we did once, and moving forward, that's you know off the table. Well, also, so let's kind of give the listeners context and just to set things up a little bit here. So back in Lorwyn, we we wanted to make the game more complex, or sorry, we wanted to make the game more complex. We wanted to make the game simpler. So we, but. A thing that happened is even though we thought we were making things simpler after Time Spiral, because Time Spiral was like this huge mess of mechanics and people couldn't understand it very well, so we made it all about creature interactions. But what we found was, even though they were all simple creature interactions, it was still a lot of onboard complexity, a lot of really confusing commons. You have minus X, minus zero effects, and tribal things counting over here, and it was still just super complex. So for M10, we came up with something called New World Order, which basically it's a long list of rules about how complex a common can be. But the thing about New World Order that I want to stress is the rule has been, and always has been since we came up with it, that 80% of your commons in a set have to adhere to New World Order. So there's always room for some amount of, of complexity in commons. Just, you know, different people have different ideas of, of where that line is. And that kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier with, you know, a, a, any individual lead designer kind of being like, the writer of a show, where different people put that line in different places. And Eric Lauer, who is the lead designer of Guilds of Ravnica, and you can you can actually start start to see the through lines because he led design like Guilds of Ravnica, and he also led design Return to Ravnica and Innistrad, which are, all have some complex commons. And he very much believes that you should get as close as you can with simple commons, but then sometimes you just need to make the common that does the job that is necessary. Right. And in this case, Hypothesis is totally him just thinking about it and being like, look, what is it needs at common to be competitive? Is this kind of two for one instant damage spell? We did a bunch of testing. The data says we need, need this. We're just going to make it. And you get some wiggle room like that in your commons. You get to do that because you have that 20 percent to work with. So I think it depends a little bit on who the lead designer of the set is. But there's absolutely room to make cards like that. And. We have to be, be mindful when making them, but we can make them, certainly, from time to time. I, I think the thing that just shocked me the most was seeing seeing a common with, like, that new, uh, I believe it's a reflexive trigger, the that the yeah. stop in the middle, which, and, hey, person who keeps commenting on YouTube weeks after I said it, I know there is a chance to respond to the trigger. Thank you. 
I know I got that wrong in one episode. You don't need to keep posting about it. But um, like uh, sore subject. I, I I just get the email alerts, man. Uh, but <laughs> like there were it was a it was a comment that was complex enough that like I definitely saw people get tripped up by it at the pre-release and. I, I don't know. I guess this was just like maybe the easiest example, but it definitely felt like Guilds of Ravnica was a little bit of a step outside the norm, and I'm never going to complain about that, but I, I, I did really want to know about that, and I've never also heard the kind of 80% have to follow NWO thought before, but, you know, good, good, good stuff to know. Um, yeah, and with Guilds of Ravnica... You know, you're mashing two colors together. Ravnica always has a little high complexity because you have five mechanics. Like, if you think about it, a set with five mechanics, five brand new mechanics, that's a lot. I mean, it could evoke, okay, not brand new in this case, (laughs) but still, five mechanics is a lot to deal with. So the set's already high complexity from that. You've got multicolored cards, which eats up some of your complexity. And because you have multicolored cards, you have to solve a lot of things. Like, what is a blue-red card that isn't a blue-red card we've made before or that is, is you know, doing the right thing for this, this limited format? And in this case, Hypothesis was absolutely the right card for the job. And I think it's playing out great. I, I also, before we get too off, off the beaten path, because I'm sure the listeners are like, but they never got back to that. I just wanted to talk about um, downshifting cards in Masters for a second because I know that that was Oh, that's true, earlier. that's true. No problem. You know what? I'm here. I'm here for you all. The <laughs> listeners out there who thought that was me like deftly avoiding a question and then I was going to make sure I didn't get back to it. That's not what I was doing. We'll save that for later. But, um, you know, a lot of times that is to make limited archetypes work. And in, in this case, Elvish Vanguard w- could, was a totally reasonable common to make. I mean, a strong common, don't get me wrong, but it was a fine downshift we could we could make and it ended up being the right thing for the limited archetype. So we did it. I don't think in particular that for that set they were thinking about Popper very much when they made that change, but it certainly had a huge impact in Popper. And a lot of the times, like if you look at what's going to make a difference, we have to make cards that are right for the limited format. And this is a case where where we moved it down. So yeah, rarity downshifts definitely look a lot at how the limited format is going to play out, or especially if we're moving from like rare down to uncommon, what might just be fun to have around at uncommon. Yeah, I, I, one of my side ventures is I've maintained for years a peasant cube, and the the master sets always give me such great gifts for that. They're the downshifts to common are usually appreciated. The downshifts to uncommon, man, there have been some some nutty ones in the past couple of years. What was it? A uh, undead gladiator, I think, is one of my favorites that I've gotten in a while. But um, here's a question: If you could have any card. Any one card downshifted to common, which card would you want downshifted? All right, I so so do you do you want the honest answer from my heart or a reasonable answer that could potentially happen? Why not both? All right, the unreasonable like gut reaction, astral slide, but that's just because I miss playing astral slide every chance I get. The reasonable answer is probably I'm trying to think through like. A, a piece of instant speed white removal that is two CMC or below. That's like just an open statement, like seal away, or you know what, even I'll say three or below, like seal away or stasis snare. Like I, I don't want to see something quite as good as swords to plowshares, but something in that realm. I just feel that white for a long time hasn't really had a way to interact at instant speed and that's that's the realistic answer I, i'm gonna give my pet downshift is inquisition of kozilek um you're the moving format... in the wrong direction there i think <laughs> yeah i know i know uh i i i just i like the idea in the format uh, i like that we have some car some some hand hate uh, but we don't have anything just as all purposes Inquisition. And yeah, you're right. It, it's been moved to a rare. So, but uh, a man can dream. <laughs> no, hey, I, I asked the question. I was just curious. Uh, do you have one? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a few definitely I look at. And of course, I get to, I'm cheating because I actually get to work on magic sets <laughs> oh, and put yeah, these things yeah. in there. But uh, without, you know, thinking to the, back to the future too much, something I would really like is a red common sweeper. I feel like black has that in Evan Carr's Justice, but it's really hard to make any kind of slower red deck work. 
um, without any way to deal damage. Like, I would want a way for red to be able to clear out elves, for example. And it has electricery, which is okay, but it's so easy to counterplay that with spider silk armor. So, I don't know, something like a steam blast or a pyroclasm at common would be interesting to me. Yeah, the, yeah, a lack of a sweeper is definitely something we've discussed before. Right, and like you're not getting a common white sweeper is not really reasonable because right. you know we just like that's not really a thing that we make anymore. Except for like there's like maybe one old card, three mana, non-white creatures get minus one, minus one, holy light or something. Yep. Um, and green, of course, is not getting any kind of common sweeper. So and blue isn't either. But red and black ha both having common sweepers for popper makes sense. Black has Evan Carr's justice. It would be nice if red had one. And I think I lean towards Steam Blast only because it's an instance that differentiates it from uh, blacks a little bit. Seems like it could open up some cool new decks. Give my teachings deck a good target. So I, I, I was I, I was going to say that the one that we've also talked about before is some sort of uh, and th and this was definitely more more on the nose back when uh right after modern masters 2017 when uh burning tree emissary got introduced to the format and we just had this stompy deck running wild with a wealth of x2s and could usually get to you before you got to f four mana or so and like put you in a really awkward position in terms of life total so there was a large, pretty large support from the community for some sort of infest style effect. And I think I'm still in favor of seeing something like that, but I don't think it's as necessary as it once was. Right. I mean, once again, you have Evan Carr's Justice in black. Um, you know, you've got a ton of one damage sweepers. You can do your electricers or whatever. Actually, in my teachings deck, I play one copy of Whale of the Nim, which is, I don't mm -hmm. see in a lot of builds, but it's totally awesome. Um, but... You know, I just another two damage sweeper. I think would be great and someday. I, someday. I think the problem also... is the problem is, of course, though, is even in master sets, common mm -hmm. two damage sweepers is kind of ridiculous. So it might be a while until I I get there on that one. We'll see. I was gonna say I've always I've always heard that like one of the one of the slight downfalls when it came to a uh, tempest draft was the fact that you had a block where you had even cards justice capsize at both at common and that could lead to like very unfun limited gameplay and i can believe it because i've played both of those in popper and i don't think most of my opponents have fun when i keep resolving those spells so yeah, yeah, well, don't forget common rolling earthquake by the way oh that's right that's just ridiculous oh, as man. a as a bit of a segue um potential way to introduce that sort of card to the format might be to release it in a commander uh, type environment and then get it put into a treasure chest on moto which sort of brings us to a, a subject that we definitely wanted to touch on which is namely the um, disparity between the moto card pool and the real life card pool um, that's like hands down the most popular question we got leading up to this interview and is there anything on the roadmap about you know making those match a little bit better you know, we've definitely I mean, heard of it. Like, the community tells this feedback to me all the time, so I, <laughs> I hear it pretty, pretty loud and clear. Um, you know, the, the right people know about it, and I guess what I can say is stay tuned. All right. Uh, I, I mean, it's, a, it's one of those things where we're, we're aware of it, and I'm really not being glib or anything when I say this, but, you know, we're aware of it, and um, it's not a decision that I ne necessarily get to make, and... Um, we've we've passed passed the word along, and people are looking into it, and we'll we'll kind of see where it goes. But I can't announce anything at this time. But it's definitely a noted community concern. I want everyone out there to know who sent me tweets about. It. Thank you so much <laughs> for making making me aware. I mean, it actually means a lot, um, and it's cool to know that there's this community who fervently wants this to be to be lined up. So, trust me, your concerns have been heard. So I I wanted to kind of deviate a little bit from the popper thing, while not fully deviating from it so so you've worked on a lot of these uh these supplemental products that I know, i've i've seen all the all the press around battle bond and you 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 kind of did the the mini mini press tour and you're really passionate about these as you mentioned before weird kind of niche formats um oh i love it so i'm on the product architecture team mm -hmm. um and there's a very small team okay there's only a few of us and we divvy out all of our responsibilities and I am the person who literally has written on a whiteboard in quotation marks weird products, and I just love <laughs> it, right? It's like, give me all this, the like strange off the beaten path stuff. Like you can go figure out how to you know, orchestrate 
Nicol Bolas and the Gatewatch or whatever. I'm going to be over here making, like, new ninjas and giant beetles, okay? Just, like, it's going to be great. So I, I love this stuff. And th we've got some pretty wild products coming out in the next next uh, couple years. So stay tuned. And, and, and I was kind of going to use that as a segue. There, there's another thing that I know I know the professor – uh, from Tolarian Community College has brought this up in a video and it was one that a couple of people asked us to kind of pick your brain about but there there's been this idea tossed around of popper challenger decks and I will admit I have not played standard since the last time artifact lands were legal in standard and the challenger decks definitely got me very close to buying a standard deck for the first time in Oh God! When when was Dark Steel and like Mirrodin? Two thousand four, two thousand five, something like that. Well, Ooh. technically, it was in M eleven. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Yeah, mm. sure. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, what, I got you playing an M eleven. What, what do I need to do? Uh, I actually don't think it was M eleven. It was a more recent set. Sorry, uh, yeah, I get my sets mixed up. I was making a joke. <laughs> there, there, there was the I think I think it's M fifteen. They re, you, you yeah. reprinted a uh, Dark Steel set at all? The one the one artifact land that Modern gets. Yeah, it was um, awesome. You get you got to play your scissors and enchantment on it and go yes. to town. That was great. Um, yeah. But but I guess there's and obviously you know you you can answer only as much as you can about this. But there's been this idea tossed around about like challenger decks for Popper and kind of what would these look like. And I I guess this opens like a larger topic that people will not stop asking about which is like specifically popper targeted products and obviously we have the commander sets which have become an annual thing um there seems to be pretty much annually some sort of either conspiracy battle bond that kind of off the beaten trail product um is that something that is a potential possibility in the future something that is targeted towards popper or is are, are, are people just kind of clinging on to a dream? Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm glad you like the Challenger decks. I'm glad they almost got you there. Not quite. Not almost. Quite. Almost. But, I can't I can't go back. I'm too invested in the internal formats. But, uh, yeah, that, that was a huge win for us this year, and so I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I do think it's, of course, possible. Like, we think about Magic. A lot of people think about Magic, especially as a player, as like a linear now focused timeline, right? Which makes a lot of sense because you see it's like set A comes out, set B comes out, uh, on Silvery set C comes out, whatever, right? You just see it in this timeline. Working at Wizards is a very, very different experience and you have to really get used to it because what you basically are is a time traveler. Like I'll hop from meeting from a set coming out in 2021 and go to a meeting the next day about a set coming out in 2020 and then walk into a meeting about a commander thing we're doing in four years, you know, go, go up and down the whole chain. and we're always looking at this like very long scale and it's same when you're designing cards in a set. Um, like a lot of people, when they get here, their goal is to get a card into a set as soon as possible, right? Like, hey, I'm here, I've got all these ideas, I just wanna get a card into a magic set. But once you're here for a while, when you submit a card that you really, really like and it doesn't make it into a set, you're like, totally okay, I'll get that into a set someday. It's almost like we think about it on a, like a geological time scale, when scientists talk about the Earth, right? It's like, yeah, in the past 500,000 years of Earth's history. And if you ask an average human like about what life is like, they're like, you know, the past five years. But it's like, no, the past 500,000 years. Anyway, I bring up this whole analogy to kind of mention that I think about on a daily basis magic on a very, very, very different time scale. I'm thinking five, seven, 10, 15 years ahead, okay? Um, so with that said, of course, things like this are possible way, way down the line. Absolutely. But there's many things that have to happen before we were to do something like that. And it would need, you would need things to happen like, uh, of, you know, a, a sanction events and a uh, ban list being synced up and more support, but slowly, but surely you can gain that support. It's sort of like, if you look at commander, you know, um, commander start off as a grassroots thing. And I think it took like 10 years or so for it to move from, something that was being played by Sheldon and some friends in his house all the way to a much larger support, all the way to a product release. So these things take time. Um, with all that said, of course, people telling, hey, look to head to 20 years from now is not always the most satisfying answer. <laughs> it is something that is more on our radar now than ever. 
we move quicker on things than we have in the past. And as we talked about a few times on this podcast already, the master sets and sets like Commander and Battle Bond are really great opportunities to deploy this stuff. So as we continue to move forward and, and find cool new places to put uh, put out products or cool new kinds of products to create, I'd pay attention to the common slot. Like it's pretty easy for us to, as we're making a set, be like, you know what? What if we slid in a common that was cool for Popper that didn't impact everything else going on around it too much, especially if it's not a standard legal set, like a battle bond, because you just get to make a common that's maybe a little out of place, but really fits into what's happening in the Popper world. So, you know, absolutely. I think eventually that could be the case. And I, I was going to say, I think probably the the card that, while unimpressive on its face, wound up influencing Popper the most in the past year or so has probably been Ash Barons, which was just kind of like... I, I guess Ash Barons was a while ago, wasn't it? I'm... It, it was reprinted though. It was reprinted it, this year. So it was, you know, it, you're not okay. too far off. There we go. There we go. That's what it was. But that that was one where it was a very, very simple design and it just fit in with what the format was trying to do. And so yeah, I, I definitely do every year get excited for uh Commander A because I do play Commander on my weekend time, but also because that is in terms of new stuff, definitely one of the products that I've been keeping my eye on more in recent years. Um, and, and right now, you know, we're really in the middle of a test and learn cycle. As you, we've been trying out a bunch of different things and just kind of seeing what works and then trying to, to take those things that work and make them awesome. And if they don't work, set them aside. And so in the time to come, in the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of one of products that are unusual and different or doing all kinds of, of wild things. And you can expect to for there to be some opportunities for unusual comments to show up and chances to reprint some cards that have been asked for as well. Um, so, like I said, stay tuned. All right. Um, Although, I, man, I'm trying. Uh, someday I want to get everyone Oubliette. I'm trying. <laughs> but the fact it does not fit on a Magic card makes it real hard. Do, real hard. Is it actually... It, it's got to be less words than Animate Dead, though, right? It's got to it be. It is a lot of words. First of all, <laughs> Animate Dead does not really fit on a magic card. I, it was kind of shoehorned in. But also, it is it is like a weird effect using weird words. There's a lot of things going on. I'm not saying it's impossible. <laughs> I'll, I mean, I'll try to get it in somewhere, somewhere. Actually, there's I, I tried. A, well, tried is, is a strong word. I looked at getting it into Commander 2018. Um, but it just, once again, it just didn't make sense. I was like, oh, I'll put it in the Esper deck and you can blink it, right? So you blink it a little <laughs> bit and then you like flick, like eat their things over and over, but it doesn't fit on a card. We need new artwork, all these things. Those are all surmountable things. So maybe someday you'll see it show up, but don't worry. I've got, I've got my ear to the ground when it comes to <laughs> reprints that y'all like, and I'd like to get them out someday. So, I, and also I, to be fair, Oubliette's a, a weird example, but there's plenty of popper reprints that players also want for other formats. And I definitely have my eye out for you know the preordains of the world and things like that so i, I was gonna say a while ago i it might have been a couple months ago we brought up the topic of oubliette for some reason and i actually pulled up the card and realized i have played popper for about three years at this point pretty consistently i didn't i don't i didn't know the oracle text of oubliette like i just didn't i always was just like it's black journey to nowhere and then there's a million weird things about it like i knew it took auras and counters with it but it also like returns it tapped if the creature comes back it's just i to i i appreciate you jumping right, out everyone. in front of that bullet but man everyone at home asm our fans gather around here's the full card text <laughs> of oubliette i'm just going to read it out and you can understand how long this card is if it's one black black for an enchantment. When Oubliette enters the battlefield, exile target creature and all auras attached to it. Note the number and kind of counters that were on that creature. When Oubliette leaves the battlefield, return that exiled card to the battlefield under its owner's control, tapped with the noted number and kind of counters on it. If you do, return the other exiled cards to the battlefield under their owner's control attached to that permanent that is the <laughs> rules text of oubliette which is not that's not just like what's written on some ancient magic card that is the current oracle text for oubliette now i'm not saying it's impossible for us to clean it up or things like that it's not impossible for us to, re to reprint somewhere 
I'm going to keep looking for a spot for it. But, you know, this one has some hurdles in particular. Things, uh, other cards that popper players want a little more reasonable. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely the, uh, the nightmare situation. I also just happened to glance at what the actual wording from Arabian Nights is. It's not any better. It's not one of those cases where, like, some of the old cards, the wording doesn't work in the rules, but it totally makes sense as to what the card does. This one has just always been a nightmare. Yeah, um. uh, let's, see what, let's see what we've got here. The, the old wording from Arabian Nights is, select a creature in play when Oubliette is cast. That creature is considered out of play as long as Oubliette is in play. Hence, the creature cannot be the target of spells <laughs> and cannot receive damage, use special powers, attack, or defend. All counters and enchantments on the creature remain, but are also out of play. If Oubliette is removed, creature returns the play tapped. My, fav- my favorite bit is that between the old wording, we managed to get the word hence in actual rules text. And in the current one, it requires you to take notes. Both things which are always, you know, strong signs of really great magic card design. <laughs> we should um, just make, we should just print black Oblivion Ring and be like, look, here you all, <laughs> here you are. Play it, enjoy <laughs> it, have fun. One of my favorite old rules templates is uh, cards like Cormus Bell which say treat all swamps and play as 1-1 one, one creatures. No, now they can be enchanted, killed, and so forth. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's the and so forth that gets me. Okay, here's one of my favorites. Don't look it up. Do you know what the card Ace and Crusader does? No. Oh, okay. God. This, this is something from, like, Homelands, isn't it? It is from Homelands. But this is it's, it has nothing to do with wording, just wording difference. Because this is a magic card that if, if you cast and read it, it would not do anything like what it actually does because it is a two white white for a two two summon crusader ace and crusader has power and toughness each equal to two plus the number of heroes you control okay. oh no now now <laughs> here is the current text it's a human knight by the way and it's card text is ace and crusaders power and toughness are each equal to two plus the number of soldiers and warriors you control so it's actually, in today's world, a Soldiers and Warriors tribal card, but you never understand that from reading the text. And by the way, I'm not knocking anyone for eroding it like this. It makes sense. We've turned heroes into Soldiers and Warriors. It's just really, really funny to me reading those two next to each other. <laughs> oh, man. The, 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 the old Magic card game is always always one of my favorites. A lot of, a lot of fond memories. Um, I guess moving back to uh, slight, slightly more on topic for our our podcast uh it is true ace and crusader is uncommon so technically doesn't fit the the topic yeah it, trust me i i've i've done like searches for common cards so many times at this point where i i feel like i have definitely lost memories of my childhood in favor of knowing what lava dart does yeah so. gotta get that last uh, tempest black common you know it's very important oh yeah um uh, but um, I guess you you had this this experience as a pro player, which you know a lot of people don't have that level of experience on that sort of level of competition. I guess when you look at popper decks, is there anything that surprises you about how people build for this format? Are there any things that like you mentioned coming back to the format after a long time away? Were there any things where you just like really that's uh, that's that's a thing people do here? Was there anything like that? Well, I would say the number one thing I found when I came back into the format was people just didn't play enough lands. And I still think it's true, by the way. I just don't think people put enough lands in their popper decks. Um, A lot of the decks are built in such a way where it seems like if you get disrupted at all, you won't have the mana you need. Or I just see people, like when I play on Magic Online, people just mulligan tons and tons all the time. And I'm just sitting over here with like my 27 land mystical teachings deck. Like, all right, go for it. And I think part of that is the bounce lands. The bounce lands are super tempting to be like, oh yeah, you just play a bunch of bounce lands and then you don't have any trouble hitting your land drops. But there's so many hands with like double bounce land or forbid someone like ever capsizes one of your bounce lands or something and sends you back to the Stone Age. Um, so that's one big thing right off the cuff that that personally i still feel people get wrong with with their deck building although in the past few months it has gotten better as decks have gotten more and more refined but i still feel like people are a little bit 
a little bit light on lands. The other thing, though, is just, and this is just a deck building thing, which surprised me, is a number of times I've looked at a deck and been like, man, there's got to be a better win condition for this deck. And then you look through the creatures, and you're just like, nope, nope, definitely not. <laughs> because Popper's an uh, interesting format in that its spells are amazing. They're like legacy-powered spells, right? You've got Brainstorm, Lightning Bolt, Crop Rotation, like all these absurdly powerful cards. But then the creatures, on the whole, are just wretched. Like, yeah, Ur Ur Gurmag Angler is like as good as it gets, and it's a 5-5, five -five, right? I, um, I was brewing this Tron deck, because I, I saw all these Tron decks people were playing, like these four or five color Tron decks with Denrova Horror and stuff like that. And um, I was like, okay, whatever. Surely there's got to be a better Tron deck I can build. So I built a mono green Tron deck that hit turn three on Tron almost every game. Like, it was super consistent. You'd go, you had, like, chromatic spheres, chromatic stars. You had crop rotation, like the whole shebang. Hitting Tron was no problem on turn three. But the problem is you'd go, like, Tron, wretched Griff. It's like, okay, <laughs> well, three, four flyer draw a card. That's the best you can do. And, yeah, like, Ulamog's Crusher does exist. I get it. But, um, yeah, it's... The the threats are really weak in Popper, and that's actually a thing I might look to to if I were to put more cards in sets. Just making random common like seven mana reasonable creatures for Popper could be pretty cool because green kind of has this thing in Popper right now where it has a ton of ramp spells but not a lot of great things to ramp to, and giving it a top end could be really nice to give a different kind of deck differentiation. I was gonna say back in the day there was a green ramp deck and it ramped into and. Here, I'm I'm wondering if you you actually remember this one. It ramped into Orox Herd as one of its payoffs. Oh yeah, dude, you can't like... beat that. <laughs> how, how are you gonna beat Orox Herd? There's another one where that one came from. <laughs> now we have self assembler, so that's a little better. Uh, uh, self assemblers don't buff one another. That's oh, that, got me there. That's a big downside right there, buddy. Um, but like, I I think I think you did hit on two things, and. I, I'm glad to hear that someone can look in on the format and just go, people aren't playing enough lands because that is one of the things, like, I don't know if you've looked at an elves list, re uh, elves list recently, but the fact that people are running 13 lands is always, even in elves, just always you, seems like the you, you slimmest of margin. You can't just cut lands for <laughs> um, for land grants. It's just not, no, that, that's, you can't do that. It's not reasonable. I, Please don't I am do that. so glad we agree on that because that's actually a, a big point of contention. Um, that yeah, yeah, we 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 had uh, we had another popper content creator, the Maverick Girl, on, and she has been grinding elves for years, and that was one of the f biggest things that she wanted to address. She was just like, "Don't play land grant." Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, stop. Kendra knows what she's talking about. I think that elves is one of the best decks in the format. Um, but also, while we're at don't play land grant, like, your deck should always have four of these, okay? You should always have four Nettle Sentinels. You should always have four Heritage Druids. You should always have four Elvish Visionaries. And you should probably always have, like, four Lino War Elves. I've seen so many deck lists that just, like, don't, like, play, like, two Nettle Sentinels or something. I'm like, what are you doing? Nettle Sentinels, super important. Anyway, well, I've got to I will say we can't play Heritage Druid. Or, sorry. Uh, uh, Quarian Ranger? Oh, uh, sorry. My bad. I should have maybe? made that jump. Yeah, sorry. I, I meant like uh, I meant um, I meant. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Bir Birchlore Rangers. Birchlore so, Ranger. Yeah, that that actually, sorry. That was I was totally not trying to got you there. So <laughs> I should I should have made the leap to the next card. Yeah, it it, it took us the, a moment, but we all got there. But I understand what you mean. More mana sources. Well, it's yeah. It's just also these are just cards you'd actually just play. Like they're the the best cards in the elves deck. Like I would just anyway. I've got strong opinions about that. So. <laughs> no, no, no. Good. That, that's good. good. Like I, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Like someone who has been playing the game as long as you came into the format and just immediately was like, "All right, here you go. The, the this is what you're doing wrong." And it's been stuff that we have been yelling about for probably years at this point so oh man especially Validation when i see like a, a 22 good. land control deck with like three radiant fountains i'm just like man come on come oh, on ra radiant fountain is a great point of consternation for a lot of a lot of folks that we talk with and i i just don't get when i see it in a deck with a ton of double color mana spells that just needs to be able to hit these restrictive mana costs and it's just like yeah sure i'll i'll play two radiant fountains in like 20 odd lands it's like please don't do this please yeah, i guess anyway. it i guess it really is legacy lie with the greedy mana bases <laughs> 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 uh, 
Anyway, I've got opinions about Popper Deck Building. So, so my, uh, you know, I appreciate you allowing me to air my land PSA. Play more lands. There's oh, literally a meme of me saying play more lands. You should do it. Also, you didn't care for Dinrova Horror as a finisher? I'm, I'm, I'm like, shocked here. I, I, I think that that's probably one of the best Tron finishers we've ever had. Yeah, it's a f- yeah I mean, it's- I mean, Dinrova Horror is to- totally fine, but I just wanted to play, like, a mono green Tron deck, you know? Yeah, it, it's but, definitely... but then, by the way, then my next evolution was realizing with four chromatic spheres and four chromatic stars and four um, expedition maps, you could just play whatever colors you wanted. So <laughs> then I was right back where I started. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely always been kind of kind of greed mode. It is interesting. I, I while while you were talking about that, I got curious to see what seven drops there were in the format, and I had forgotten how completely barren it is, which is interesting because I admittedly i don't play a lot of modern i don't pay a lot of attention to it but like modern has a bunch of really solid seven generic mana spells and i hadn't realized how like deeply unimpactful some of the ones at common are like mirror enforcer is technically a seven drop and accomplished automaton which is a five it's a hex plate goal and that can have a plus one plus one counter or a little buddy so I don't know. I guess I guess there is still still room for some some design space in there, but um, well, you know, w- when we make commons, generally we try to not make a lot of big expensive commons because yeah, yeah, we want to yeah. save that for the exciting like you know rares and and mythics and even uncommons. But it's a thing we can think about more. And it turns out, yeah, maybe just putting one in a set here and there will go a long way. So we'll stay on top of it. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 really interesting to kind of get these. I don't want to say outsider opinions, but like having having someone come insider in insider opinions, y- y- yeah, in- insider opinions. But having you come back to the format, and I did find it funny that like after all these years, it's just right back to teachings immediately. Um, but I, I do think it's interesting to kind of see an outsider's uh, outsider insider neither of the above opinion about this format. A, a geological opinion, basically. Gavin's like this old elf who will far outlive us as humans so his <laughs> sense of scale is just much different from ours um i i guess one of the other things i i know that the ban list is something that a lot of people asked us to ask about um and when it comes to the popper ban list in particular it feels like it's the deftest of touches in terms of being relatively small but i guess and I don't know if this is this is gonna gonna fly, but um, with the with the process for monitoring a format, how is is there anything you can kind of clue us in on about the process behind determining cards being banned? Yeah, abs- I mean, a- absolutely. You know, we monitor Popper. We we get all, for example, the Magic Online data about all the events. We look through all the deck lists, and we do monitor the format check out win rates and so on and so forth. And it actually helps that so much popper play is on Magic Online. The, the majority of it, I would say, is on Magic Online because that's we can look at all that data and crunch all that as we're making our decisions on things. Um, where with, say, standard data, we, we make a lot of decisions based on our Magic Online data, but um, uh, a lot of standard, of course, happens in person. So we look at all that. We, we talk about it. I mean, once again, I'll admit that often standard, modern, you know, the formats like that are much higher on a priority list in our ban and restricted meetings, but we do talk about Popper and keep an eye on it. And as you can tell with cards like Peregrine, Dr- Peregrine Drake and Storm Spells and so on, we pay enough attention to the format that if we think something gets out of hand, we touch it. Right now, I mean, I know there's been a lot of calling for us to look at the blue decks more and, you know, it's something that we we know about, but haven't announced anything at this time, of course. Yeah, uh, I, and that's about as much as I expected to get from that because... There were definitely a lot of questions that were asked that we we knew we were we knew what we were going to get, um, but I guess I guess one of the last things I have here is kind of a, a completely non magic related thing. Uh, Ooh, you you obviously non magic. You 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 travel. I guess, I guess in a way you travel a lot. I've followed you on Twitter for quite a while, and you're always posting images of food and locales you're at. And 
I get I guess my 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 weird off the wall question that I want to get in here is what is what is one of not necessarily the top of the top but what is one of your favorite like odd local dishes that you don't think people would know about that you think people should know about odd local dishes in Seattle or somewhere in the world any anywhere you've been just give me give me one oh man there are so many great options i would it, it is it is admittedly really hard to just narrow down to to one thing so i'll give you, i'll give you a few um there's a couple of meats that are really really good that you don't really think about um but kangaroo if you're in australia it's like excellent it's super lean really really delicious very nice ostrich also if you ever have the opportunity would definitely recommend ostrich one of my favorite cities in the world to go to for food though um is new orleans and i know it's in america so it sounds kind of boring but their food scene is unbelievable and you can find things in new orleans that it's hard to find good versions of anywhere else you can walk around have like a nice muffaletta sandwich or gumbo or um uh, po' boy or whatever, and just those tastes and flavors are hard to find in other places. I haven't found them really replicated as well outside of New Orleans um, in particular. I was there for 24 hours last year, and I ate at 11 restaurants in 24 hours. I just couldn't help myself. It was Jeez. also good. Yeah, I don't fool around. Um, I'm a, I really do love my food. But I will say <laughs> probably the strangest thing – I've eaten a lot of strange things, but one of the strangest things I've ever eaten – and this is not a local dish, okay? This is very hard to replicate, but it's just a fun story. Is there's this restaurant in Chicago called Alinea. It's very, very well known. It's, it's three mm -hmm. Michelin stars, super famous. Um, and they do kind of a 20-something course gastronomical meal with all kinds of wild um, infusions of things. And their trademark, and I, I, this will always stick with me, and I have a video of it because it was just so wild, is they serve you a balloon made out of taffy filled with helium. And you put your lips on the balloon and you suck out all the helium so your voice gets all squeaky and you shrink the balloon. And then you eat the taffy that the balloon was made out of. And it is truly a wild experience. It is <laughs> really, really out there as far as food experiences go. Um, That's real Willy Wonka. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, if any of you out there are going to a country or place in the U.S. and want food recommendations... I can recommend you places in most major cities. I've been to almost 80 countries, so a lot of countries you'd go to. I can definitely send you recommendations for too. So um, hit me up. I Whether it's like, yeah, three Michelin star place or just a hole in the wall in China, I've got places for you. So Wonderful. I, I definitely wanted to get at least one food question on here because that, that is always always something that we we care a lot about. We, we both cook a lot, although I've, I've been – a little on the busy side lately. I haven't gotten to do much home cooking, but I mean, we yeah. all got to eat, right? So might as well make sure you eat eat this good. Whenever someone's like, "Yeah, we're just gonna walk over to the cheesecake factory or something," I'm like, "No, don't go. <laughs> we can definitely do better than that. Like, you can pay less money, have a faster meal that is more delicious. I can guarantee I can find that for you." Basically, we're at the point where every at least reasonably sized city in the world has good food because the world's so close together now. Ingredients are e so easy to find that. You can find good stuff pretty much, pretty much everywhere. So, um, and I recommend everyone to get out and travel too. I'm a big traveler. I've, I travel a lot. Sometimes maybe too much. I've spent four weekends at home since May, so uh, not, I haven't been around very much. But I do love getting out and seeing the stuff in the world. So, if you need any recommendations to either of you two wonderful hosts or any listeners, just hit me up. Send me a tweet. Wonderful. All right. Um, I think I think that kind of wraps it up. I do I do really want to thank you for coming on tonight, Gavin. Um, I, I know you were quite busy with assorted things and I do really want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us. It was a absolute honor and we were really glad to get someone from wizards because there's, we're, we're a format that has always kind of had people like speculate on how, how the format is viewed by wizards. And now we actually got a chance to talk to someone and hopefully there's a handful of questions that we can now just point to this episode and say, look here, Gavin's got you. But uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, speak with us tonight. No, it's really my pleasure. And really, at the end of the day, what I'd say to anyone who has questions is just we, are, we do listen. And I know it seems like sometimes there's a lot of community sentiments about things and, and it seems like we're not saying anything or we don't hear you. 
But trust me, we see what makes the top of Reddit or even the front page of Reddit. I see what's t- every tweet that's tweeted at me. I read them all. So does everyone at Wizards, and we talk about it and pass it along. And we know about these things, and we're going to talk about everything internally and make decisions on it. And sometimes there'll be decisions that you like, and sometimes there'll be decisions that you maybe don't like. But I want you to all know that we do listen to everything, and we do talk about it. So no matter how things end up, know that we have heard and listened to everything thing that, that you've said. Well, thank, thank you so much for this. It was, it was very enlightening. And yeah, they do listen to you, everyone. I know, I know it seems like sometimes they don't, but they do. All right. Um, Adrian, uh, do you want to take us out of the show for the evening? Yeah. Thanks for, to everyone for joining us today, especially Gavin. Uh, this podcast is brought to the support of our patrons. Please consider supporting us if you like the show. I don't think I've given uh, him a shout out yet, so I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out to eHustle. Uh, thank you so much for being a patron. You've been a big supporter of ours. Uh, check below this video or the description of this podcast for more details on where to find us. Uh, we'd like to remind you, if you're listening to this on a platform with reviews, they're always appreciated because they boost our visibility. If you've got a deck list or idea for a topic, you can contact us either via our website or you can email us directly at colorcommentary at gmail.com. Special thanks to my LGS Pat's Games and Mike's LGS JP Comics. And of course, the ever musical L. You can find our theme song, Quantitative, and other great tracks over at his SoundCloud, which is soundcloud.net forward slash E-L-L, E-L-L, E-L-L. Till next week, this is Adrian and Mike, and we are signing off for Color Commentary. Thank you.